And I want to pick up on uh, what Congressman Marshall said. I think it's vital. If, if this is going to work, by definition, it has to be bipartisan. Uh, because if you're trying to get 290 votes in the House and 68 votes in the Senate, uh, you simply have to have a bipartisan effort to make it happen. Uh, it is, it is uh, the last time we did it, uh, Charlie Stenholm, a Democrat from Texas, uh, and Bob Smith, a Republican from Oregon, uh, were really the driving forces. They pulled together over a, several years. It was a, it was a very substantial project. But gradually the country came to agree, and as people talked it through, uh, sort of one member at a time, they just kept picking up momentum. And uh, when we uh, took control in early 95, uh, bringing up one of the planks in the contract with America had been voting on the balanced budget amendment. We got a substantial constitutional majority in the House, and we came within one vote in the Senate. And I believe that the country facing the scale of deficit we're facing, and I do agree with Congressman Marshall's description that it is, it is essentially immoral uh, to be dumping this kind of debt on our children and our grandchildren. Uh, and I think the country will come to that kind of a, a commitment, too. I want to thank Bob Goodlatte for uh, taking up the cause uh, and continuing to develop this. And, and uh, I, I must say, uh, as, as your first uh, venture uh, as a member of Congress, creating a bipartisan caucus on this topic is a pretty good-sized venture. So I'm delighted you all are working together, and this is, this is great. I, my job, I thought, uh, was to sort of give you an initial... Uh, overview both of what we did in the past and, and why we should do it. I, I strongly favor setting a deadline to get to a balanced budget. I'm, I'm for a balanced budget amendment, but one of the great lessons we learned when we failed by one vote in the Senate, uh, we had a leadership meeting one night in the Capitol, and we said, you know, we'd promised we could balance the budget within seven years if we passed the amendment. What if we pretended we passed the amendment and just went ahead and balanced the budget? And we talked it through for several hours, and we reached the entirely voluntary decision. It was actually an act of utter irrationality. We said, we're going to take on the burden of balancing the federal budget, which at that time was projected to have about a $200 billion deficit annually forever. I mean, there was, there was zero indication in Congressional Budget Office scoring that it was ever going to be less than $200 billion. And so uh, we set out to do it. John Kasich deserves a great deal of credit. He was our budget committee chairman, although there is one great story. At one point, uh, the White House initially was fighting us. Ultimately, President Clinton came along, but his staff was very resistant. Uh, and uh, at one point, Kasich came in and said, this is really going to be much harder than we think. Do we really have to do it in seven years? And everybody who didn't have the response for the budget committee said, of course we do. We, we said seven years. And he said, well, where does it say in stone that it's seven years? I said, well, let's take a vote. And everybody in the leadership except Kasich voted for seven. So the following week, we handed him a large marble slab for his desktop that had balanced budget seven years engraved. And we said, okay, it's now engraved in stone. This is over. What's amazing, I was actually surprised in preparation for this. Uh, I asked uh, my staff to go back and look at what actually happened. We actually ended up with a balanced budget in two years. Now, it wasn't nearly the size deficit you're faced with, but it was, it was a combination of three different things I want to emphasize. From it. And we have a handout here for all of you. I hope you'll feel free to take home with you from American Solutions. The, the first thing was we cut taxes to accelerate economic growth. We didn't raise them. And we were very aggressively in favor of economic growth. And I think, I think frankly, where the country is right now at 9.9% unemployment, with this morning's number that the first-time application for unemployment had gone up by 30,000, uh, I think the, the country is going to demand that we put increase, solving the jobs problem uh, as our first goal. But that turned out to have a huge secondary effect because it took people off of unemployment, off of Medicaid, off of receiving government money, and it put them into jobs where they were paying taxes. So the dual effect of declining cost and rising revenue really had a huge impact. Of, in all fairness to the Clinton years, were actually very good years for economic growth. And I mean, I take a fair amount of credit for that on the Republican side. But it was a genuinely bipartisan achievement. Uh, and as the president himself noted at a, at a recent event that he and Trent Lott and I did. The second thing we did that made a huge difference is we really controlled spending. Uh, in the four years I was speaker, we kept the average annual growth of the federal government to 2.9% a year. Which, which is the lowest rate, and that included all the entitlements, 
which is the lowest rate of growth since Calvin Coolidge in the early 1920s. And that was a very key part of this. Uh, I think, again, you're in a different environment. I think you actually, if you're serious about getting to a balanced budget, actually have to think about ways to, f to dramatically reduce spending because it has grown 37% in the last three years, and, and it's probably unsustainable. The, the third thing, though, that's equally important is we were in the replacement business, not the reform business. If you look at the welfare reform that we passed, it was a fundamental replacement of the existing system. 65% of the people on welfare either went to work or went to school. Uh, and, and the result was a dramatic change for both for the state governments and the federal government. We also had a significant reform to Medicare, uh, which was our most difficult project. I only mention those as background because I am totally for the effort to create a balanced budget amendment. I think that creating a, a national conversation on this topic is a very timely thing to be doing. I think the country will, in fact, talk to the members of the House and Senate pretty aggressively because the country, from everything I've seen, the country is very concerned about the scale of deficit spending and very concerned about the size of government. I do have a couple of fairly controversial positions that I, I don't ask any of the members who are here um, to necessarily associate themselves with, but it comes out of our background in doing this. I'll share with you, uh, we used sort of two quotes in the past. One was one by Einstein that, that uh, the definition of insanity uh, is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And I think that's part of what Congress and the President have to come to grips with. It's part of what governors and state legislatures have to come to grips with. We're not going to fix these problems with marginal changes. Uh, we're going to have to have very significant change, which leads me to my, my second quote that we rely on a lot by General Eisenhower, who said in World War II, uh, whenever I see a problem I can't solve, I always make it bigger. That when you, that you literally have to grow it out to a point where you can see the outline of a solution. And I have found that to be generally true. When we set out, after, after we'd had dinner and decided we'd balance the budget, we began meeting with, with about 12 to 15 CEOs a week. Every Wednesday night, we'd have a dinner in the Capitol, and, and uh, people, we'd bring in people to talk, and we'd say to them, we're undertaking this multi-hundred billion dollar project, and this is really big change. What is your advice about really big change? And, and three patterns came out from the CEOs. Uh, that was just over and over again for about five or six weeks as we listened to them. The first was set very large goals with very short deadlines. Uh, and here I give uh, Bill Archer at Ways and Means and Tom Bliley at Energy and Commerce and Bob Livingston at Appropriations uh, and John Kasich uh, at, at Budget and then Dick Army who coordinated all this. I give them tremendous credit because we were prepared to say, all right, if the – remember, a $200 billion annual deficit – over five years is a trillion dollars, which back then was real money. Uh, and so you're really trying to change a fairly substantial pattern. And they were prepared to go out and accept that kind of a goal. The second thing they said is delegate very aggressively and, and hold people responsible for results but not for process. Don't try to micromanage. And so, we, again, we had every single committee in the House working on what would you do to get to a balanced budget? How would you get it done? Here's your goal. You think it through. The third thing I thought was fascinating, they said, allow no experts in the room. They will slow everything down, and they'll tell you what you can't do. And, and, and again, the, the CEO after CEO had the same pattern. I believe if I, we included a quote that's two days old, I think, or three days old, by the governor of, of the Bank of England. I just think it's worth your reading. One of the reasons you're going to see enormous pressure for a balanced budget amendment is that what we're seeing happen in Greece, what we're seeing happen in Sacramento, the scale of decay in Michigan, the problems in Albany, New York, what we're watching Governor Chris Christie do in, in Trenton, which I think is the, the most interesting experiment in uh, reducing cost I've seen in the country. All these things are just harbingers of a much bigger long-term problem. Government is the fourth bubble after information technology in 1999 housing in 2007, um, Wall Street in 2008, and government is the biggest of the four bubbles. And nobody has a very there's, – there's no political philosophy, no political party that has a very good explanation of how you're going to get this bubble to come down to a manageable size uh, without a catastrophe. And it's a huge problem. If you watch the level of anger in Greece and you look at what's starting to happen in Spain, uh, this is going to be an enormous challenge for all of us. Um, when we balanced the budget, um, we really set a couple of standards. And it's interesting, both um, 
um, Governor Christie in New Jersey and Governor McDonnell in Virginia have adopted in many ways our pattern, which is to say we were prepared to look at any idea except a tax increase. Uh, and we felt very strongly that America is not a country which is undertaxed. It's a country which is overspent. And that we really, and I would say at 9.9 percent .9 unemployment, this is, this is truer than ever. I mean, I think t uh, my strongest advice to the, to the Deficit Commission is to rename themselves the Spending Commission. I mean, I, th I think if they come up, I'll just speak on, on again, without being partisan, on, on behalf of conservatism, if they come up with a tax increase, the Deficit Commission is dead as far as I'm concerned. I mean, they, they might as well not report because the country is not going to tolerate it. I mean, and this, this is bipartisan. I mean, if you look at the Democrat who won the other night in Pennsylvania in the special election, he won running as a very conservative Democrat. Uh, and if you look at Rand Paul's victory over the Kentucky Republican establishment, there's a signal there. You look at Bob Bennett, who's a great guy, and what happened to him in Utah. Now, this country is beginning to get genuinely fed up with spending uh, and, and I think really wants to see a focus on spending. Um, I'll just say one or two other things that, that I, I think are important to, to focus on. We have to find a way to get to long-term successful growth. To do that, we have to benchmark ourselves against China and India. I, I, every, I was in Wisconsin yesterday and I made the point don't benchmark yourself against Michigan. Don't benchmark yourself against Illinois. Don't benchmark yourself against Minnesota. If you want to think about the future of job creation in Wisconsin, you benchmark against China and India. And I think symbolically, it should say something to all of us. The Jaguar is now a company owned by India, and that Volvo is a, co is a, is a company now owned by China. And that means you've got to think about how you're going to balance the budget adopting policies that accelerate productivity, investment, and job creation that are permanent. And, and I, I really want to say this because I, I, I'm going to close this and I'll take questions, but this is my, I say this to my conservative friends and my fiscal conservative friends. Being against stupid spending does not mean being against all spending. And being cheap in the narrowest sense may not be smart. There's some parts of the, government, of the budget you may want to increase. There are other parts of the government you may want to eliminate, but you've got to have some sense of balance. Uh, and all, if all we try to do is go around and nick 4% off of everything, we won't, there's no possibility we can reshape our investment strategy to compete with China and India. Plus and I had the experience of being in China last August. We, we went to four cities. In every city, we were hosted by the government or by the party. And everywhere we went, it was really very interesting. The leading people who would, who would host us would say, we don't understand your country. They said, you know, we have an investment strategy, and we're going to build 225-mile-an-hour railroads between every single Chinese city, and when we're done with our investments, we're actually going to own a railroad. And we don't understand this stimulus concept because you Americans aren't creating a better future. I mean, here I am being lectured by the Chinese on a sound long-term investment approach to how we think. But I believe that's right. There are parts of our government we should increase. We need more infrastructure. Now, we, we can increase it creatively. We can have private sector partnerships. We can do lots of other things. I would increase dramatically what we spend on research and, and, and health because it's going to pay us back over the next 20 years. So, and we did this. We doubled the NIH budget while balancing the federal budget. So I would just urge you, if you, could, if you even if you had a small federal government, It'd be two trillion, two and a half trillion. That's the small version. Shaping it so it's the right two and a half trillion is a part of where you've got to go. I want to be helpful any way I can. American Solutions will be helpful any way it can. Uh, I think if we arouse enough public interest, you're going to have an amazing number of folks sign up. I agree with you that you're on a path that will work, and I do think it's possible to build a bipartisan coalition, bring this to a vote, and send to the Senate a balanced budget amendment. And I think that would be very good for the country, and we'll do all we can to help make that happen this year.